Good morning. This lecture video is going to look at bone structure. So we'll look at the gross anatomy of a bone, specifically a long bone. We will talk about the different cells that make up a bone. And then we will look at the tissues involved in bones, the two types of tissues. So bone is differs greatly from the other tissues in our body because it's hard and many of its functions depend or are rely on that characteristic hardness of it. Here's a picture of a structure of a long bone. So we're kind of going to look at the gross anatomy or the things that we can actually see if we looked at a bone. A long bone has two parts, the diathesis and the epiphysis. The diathesis is the tubular shaft that runs between the proximal and the distal ends of the bone. So depending on where you're at, this is the proximal epiphysis, okay, closest to the point of attachment. This is the distal epiphysis. So I always remember epiphyses is an E and so are ends. These are the ends. And then the diathesis is that long shaft. The hollow region within the diaphysis is called the medullary cavity, and this is filled with yellow bone marrow, which we talked about in the last lecture video. It is responsible for making lipids. The walls of the diaphysis are composed of dense and hard compact bone, and we'll talk about the difference between compact bone and spongy bone a little bit later in this video. So the ends are the epiphyses, okay, and these are typically filled with spongy bones. So the shaft is compact bone, and then the ends are going to be spongy bone. And that is where your red bone marrow fills the spaces in between that spongy bone. So red bone marrow, remember, is where your blood cells are made. Each epiphysis meets the diaphysis at the metaphysis, which is going to be kind of just that transition area between the two. This is where your plate is. So you can see here this ephesial plate, which is a layer of cartilage that is growing in the bone. And this is what allows our bones to grow in length. So when bone stops growing, you know, usually between 18 and 21 years, the cartilage will eventually be replaced with bone tissue. And that will mean that this will solidify through. So a doctor can take an x-ray of your long bones, and if they see that this line of cartilage, this ephesial line is still there, sometimes it's called the ephesial line, sometimes it's called the ephesial plate, then they know you're still growing. But in my case, because I am past the age of 21, they will not see this line, it will have been filled in with bone tissue, and so I am no longer growing. The medullary cavity here is going to be lined with a tissue, a membrane called the endosteum, and this is where bone growth, repair, and remodeling occurs. And I'll show you a picture of that right here. So here's the endosteum. It's going to line the inside here of the bone. The outer surface of the bone is covered with a fibrous membrane called the periosteum. So that's up here. That's going to be what you actually see when you look at a bone. So those are the two. Endosteum is going to line the inside and the periosteum periosteum right here is going to be what you see or line the surface. The periosteum contains blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatic vessels, and its job is to kind of nourish the bone, to give the bone the nutrient it needs to grow. Um, it's also a place, the periosteum, for tendons and ligaments to attach to the bones so that it can function in its job of allowing us to move. And the periosteum is going to cover the entire bone except for the very ends of the epiphyses, which is going to be covered with articular cartilage. So a thin layer of cartilage, and its job is to help reduce friction when your bones are rubbing against other bones. So again, epiphyses, diaphyses, and the transition between the ends and the shaft is going to be the metaph metaphysis. The epiphyses are made of spongy bone. The diaphysis is made of compact bone. There's a layer, a membrane layer inside that lines this medullary cavity or this hollow cavity in the long bones called the endosteum. And then the outside covering of the bone is the periosteum. Again, this is just another diagram. I think this one shows the endosteum pretty well because you can see it's covering this inside versus the periosteum, which is down here. And then spongy bone and compact bone, which we'll talk about in just a second. 
So let's talk about the different cells that actually make up bone. Bone contains a relatively small number of cells, and those cells are actually embedded in this matrix of fibers, so collagen fibers, and those fibers provide a surface for inorganic salt crystals to join to or stick to. These salt crystals are formed when two compounds, calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate, join together to create a compound called hydroxyapatite. And it ends up crystallizing or calcifying on those fibers that are surrounding the bone cells. And these crystals is what is going to give the bone its hardness or its strength. So even though we're going to talk about these bone cells, the fibers, the collagen fibers that are surrounding them that allow these crystals to form, they are what is going to give the bones its characteristic hardness. So they're really important. Um, although bone cells compose a small amount of the volume of bone tissue because there's so many fibers and salt crystals there, they are very crucial to the function of bones. And there are basically four different types of bone cells that we talk about. First is the osteoblast. So the osteoblast is the bone cell that's responsible for forming new bone. That's its job. It's found, most of these cells are found in the growing portions of the bone. So that would be like the periosteum and the endosteum. These cells do not divide. What they do is make and secrete collagen matrix and those salts that we just talked about. So basically, the matrix that the osteoblasts calcify, so all of that webbing, matrix is, how about webbing is a better word matter. So that webbing of fibers surrounds the osteoblasts, it becomes trapped in it, and as a result, once it's trapped inside of there, it's going to become then an osteocyte. So basically, basically an osteoblast will be will end up, it makes collagen, that collagen surrounds the cell in like a web of fibers, and then that cell, that osteoblast becomes an osteocyte. The osteocyte is the primary cell of a mature bone, and it is the most common type of bone cell. So each osteocyte is located in a space called the lacuna, and we'll talk about that when we get to the tissue here in a second, and it's surrounded by bone tissues. And the job of the osteocyte is to maintain the mineral concentration of that matrix, and it does this using different kinds of enzymes. This cell, an osteocyte, just like an osteoblast, does not go through mitosis. So neither of these, these two cells are going through that reproductive stage. They can communicate with each other, interestingly enough, but they can't reproduce. So that kind of leaves us with the question, well, how do we replace bone cells then if our osteoblasts and our osteocytes don't reproduce? Well, we have a third type of cell called the osteogenic cell. These cells are undifferentiated, so they're like stem cells, and these cells are going through mitosis very, very rapidly. They're actually the only cell that can divide. So immature osteogenic, cell, osteogenic cells are going to be found very deep in the layers of the periosteum and in the bone marrow. And then as they mature, they're going to differentiate or specialize into osteoplasts. And then again, those osteoblasts will make that webbing or that matrix and surround itself and then become an osteocyte. So all bone cells, osteoblasts, osteocytes, come from these osteogenic stem cells. Your bone, even though we don't think of it because it's hard and it's, it looks kind of, I don't know, boring, sort of, we don't think of it as being a very active tissue, but it's a really, really active tissue because just like your skin, where old skin cells get sloughed off, same with bone. There has to be a way for your bone to maintain its shape. If we have bone growth occurring our entire lifestyle, our entire life cycle, then we're going to have these huge, massive, thick bones, right? So we actually have a cell that breaks down bone, and these are called osteoclasts. And the reason that we would need to break down bone is, number one, let's say, for instance, the calcium levels in our 
blood are very, very low. We need calcium for our nerves to function. We need calcium for our muscles to contract. So if we do not have enough calcium in our blood supply, then osteoclasts will actually start breaking down bone in order to release that calcium into the blood so that we have enough to do those functions that are involved with the nervous and the muscular system. They also play a role in breaking down um, injured bones, unnecessary injured cells, unnecessary cells, cells that are just old. So they kind of are just like, they kind of clean everything up all of the time. So these cells are constantly working. And in a perfect environment, we have a balance between the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. So the osteoblasts are making new cells and the osteoclasts are destroying cells. And in perfect harmony, they're both working together kind of at the same rate when there's nothing going on to kind of maintain our bone shape. So those are the four types of bone cells. And again, you can kind of see that here. The osteocyte helps maintain our bone tissue. The osteoblast forms the bone matrix, and eventually these will be surrounded by those fibers. The osteogenic cells are going to be the stem cells, so they will eventually turn into osteoblasts. And then the osteoclasts are going to reabsorb a bone or break down bone. So let's look at bone tissue. So there are two main parts of bone tissue. They are the cells, which we just talked about, and they make the matrix and build and break down the tissue. And then there's the matrix, which we also talked about. This is what's going to be those calcium salts that I just referred to. It gives the bone its physical characteristic. And the minerals that are going to be involved mostly in that are going to be calcium and phosphorus in order to make, again, that hydroxyapatite chemical. There are two types of bone tissue, spongy bone and compact bone. And this is a great um, histogram showing the the two of them. Compact bone is very thick and very hard and very dense. It's not solid. Okay, sometimes we think of bones as being completely solid through, but it's not solid. And then spongy bone over here is going to be like a network. It looks like a sponge, a network of different needles, and we call those needles trabeculae. And this is going to be where our red bone marrow sits in between these needles, and then the yellow bone marrow would be within that compact bone. So here's another histogram showing compact bone showing spongy bone so if we kind of looked at the microscopic structure of compact bone so the microscopic structural unit of compact bone is called an osteon so each one of these circles here is an osteon here's a drawing that was made of an osteon or an haversion system sometimes it's called a haversion system but most often it's called an osteon each osteon is composed of rings of calcified matrix called lamellae. So lamella would be the singular. So you, again, you can see each one of these rings then is the lamellae. Running down the center of each osteon then is a central canal. You can see that right here, or a haversion canal. These contain blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatic vessels. These vessels and nerves are gonna branch out at a right angle through a perforating canal which is also known as the Volkmann's canal, to extend to the periosteum and the endosteum. So that's kind of what these are showing over here. Osteocytes then, so those bone, those mature bone cells, are located inside spaces called the lacunae. And these are found at the borders of adjacent or next door neighbor lamellae. So you can see here that these cells would kind of be sitting right in here between these adjacent rings. Not only do, does this system bring in blood supply to it, so providing nutrients, but it's also going to be how the, the compact bone or the bone is going to get rid of waste. So the way that this is designed brings in nutrients and helps get rid of waste. Spongy bone, which is going to be found in the epiphyses then, okay, is going to be a needle-like structure. Here's the trabeculae. You can see that. Each trabeculae forms along lines of stress. And this is important because this is what's going to give strength to the bone. And this network of trabeculae provides balance to the dense and heavy compact bone by making the bone lighter so the muscle can move them more easily. 
So that compact bone is really important for the strength part, but we don't want it to be so heavy that the muscles can't move it. And so that's kind of where this spongy bone comes in. And then again, inside this, like in this pink area, is going to be, or where blood cells would actually be made. Last structure of the bone is the nutrient forum. So spongy bone and the medullary cavity are going to receive nourishment from arteries that pass through the compact bone. And they pass through through this canal or this small opening that's found in the diaphysis. You can see it right here called the nutrient foramen. So basically the nutrient foramen is where the arteries, which are bringing nutrients in, are going to supply the blood, first the compact bone, then down to the spongy bone, and then also where the veins are going to collect the waste and take it out. So those are the structures and cells and tissues of bones.